This is Cal Cat, the Cal Catster. On February 1st, 2016, I noticed that the other channel from a couple of weeks ago we were not updating, although I was updating the other channel, the uh, reviews channel, adding more reviews to it. Uh, it now has 100 and, almost 170 videos. Uh, this one has 220 something videos and the last thing I did on the other channel was a review of the mole on the back of my neck which was really strange uh, yeah it's uh, anyway so it's pretty much peeled and stuff but yeah um so in the month of February uh, it is Mark's Hard's birthday it is the birthday of the the former martial art grandmaster and Kim. It is the birthday of uh, Tim Cantrell in three or four days. Uh, many other people. Uh, my mother's birthday, and uh, she'll be 80 in, in February 13th. And and there's probably a special doing with that, but we can't post it. Uh, um, yeah, so the month of February. Deadpool's is coming out, that new movie. Uh, that's not actually a Marvel movie, that's actually a Fox film movie. So it's like the people that did uh, X-Men. That's why there's X-Men people. So it's the X-Men people. I didn't think Disney would get away with making a rated R Marvel movie. So it's gonna be like a Marvel crossover sort of thing. So it's not part of the cinematic universe. So we'll be reviewing that on the other channel. And, yeah, um, meanwhile, over on one of the websites, and Jason Colavito's Fringe Theory site, he's been pestered by the, uh, by some of the Fringe people, including a guy who calls himself Pulitzer. Scott Walter has kind of backed off, and now it's Pulitzer. Uh, he's been over on other blogger channels harassing them, saying they're all liars and frauds. Well, it takes one to know one, Mr. Fake Pulitzer. <laughs> uh, apparently, he went on. This Pulitzer character went on uh, a TV show called Oak Island and claimed he had a Roman sword discovered on the island, and then refused to believe the experts who showed up and said it's fake. Happened to know the sword is fake. One of the people I'm going to chime in. Uh, because I have seen that very sword available at Walmart. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's fake. It's modern. Very modern. Uh, some tourists must have left it on the island. Anyway, so, yeah. And yet another fringy thing. Let's see. In the future months, we will attend another toy show fair. Possibly with uh, Return to Jim, Jim to Con. Uh, maybe with Mark's cards, we'll see. Uh, also, um, who has a birthday? I probably mentioned his real name by accident, but I meant it was his birthday. So, recap stuff. And I've been working on the Star Crackers novels. Star Crackers has been a while since we mentioned anything about it. It was online in 2012, and somebody hacked the channel and messed it up. It went back online on this channel in 2014. It's been there ever since. And yeah, uh, on the other parody channel, which will survive the hacking, uh, you can find all my other parodies, including the Robotech one. People are go flocking to the Endless Circle uh, Robotech three-part episode, the 65-minute one, more than they're flocking to the full movie, 90-minute version. Even though the full movie actually has some of the, I guess you would say the plot holes fixed, they are they are kind of plot holes that were fixed, uh, and and it has well woven into the story. It's the same story, uh, some other filler that fills in gaps, uh, and it's more of a a fan thing than the other one. And fixes some of the the oddities at the end too. Makes the ending a little make more sense, and the space battle makes more sense. So go to that one, check that out. Uh, the endless circle. Uh, we did plan to make a Transformers one last year, but we didn't get around to it. Uh, we're it's this is the thirtieth anniversary of Carta. It's hard to believe that. Uh, that thirtieth thirty years ago, 
we got to do something with the car now. So we need some cheap Transformers, paint them up, put them in a movie. We'll probably do that. Uh, yeah, this year. Um, let's see what else we're going to do. <laughs> the fringy stuff. They mentioned stories about giants. I don't care about you know, giant people so much. There are some in my stories, but yeah, go into that too much. Uh, there was other stuff. But unusual conspiracies and things, and, and Scott Walter becoming a, allegedly a Freemason. Yeah, the Masons did not accept Scott Walter. That that did not happen. He's making up a fake degree. Yeah, it's not true. They wouldn't accept him. They know he's one of those conspiracy nuts. Um, <laughs> I'm not in the Masons or nothing, but my grandfather on my dad's side was, actually. And it was a long time ago, so I was not. I never was in there. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he didn't talk about it. Uh, he died before I was born, so, I, my grandfather, my dad's side, the brown with me. But, yeah, um, so, anyways, yeah. Ew, it's not a super secret evil organization, anyway, it's just like a men's club, so, yeah, it's not, not. Uh, there was a new X-Files show that just came out. Yeah. I saw the first two episodes and completely missed the next two, so I guess uh, I'll wait for it to come out on video or Netflix or something and then watch it, because it completely blew off Monday and Tuesday this this time around. Um, <laughs> it, it was okay. It was better than the second movie. That's not saying much. Uh, it was not better than the first movie. Um, yeah, um... Some of it had potential. But yeah, well, yeah, more or less. So yeah. It is not likely that we'll be going back to Disneyland until probably all that Star Wars stuff is finished being built. Because otherwise, what's the point? Um, <laughs> um, so that'll be a while off. So there's, there's a toy show, I think, in March. Big Wow is in March or early April. They'll be at, we'll be at that. Fanime and Bacon will be on the sixth in the in the, in the Mortal Day weekend. Uh, we will likely not be at Fanime. We will likely be at Bacon, and uh, that is because we will be promoting a very special movie that has been five or six years in the making. Advertising the trailers, going on about it, go and see it. We're not going to show it at Bacon. We're just going to say it exists. Go and see it. We can't get permission this late in the game to show it at Bacon. It's probably already booked that stuff, but we certainly can advertise it. Uh, and yes, this this production is Star Trek Chimera. It will finally be ready for Bacon for Memorial Day weekend. And that's that's awesome. So, uh, look forward to that. Uh, it's our nod to the fans, our 50th anniversary special. Ironically, it was a 45th anniversary special when we initially started. Ten years ago, next, in December, with the first line of dialogue, the lines of dialogue that we got an actor and story. I was looking back on the story legend, and they apparently started as a legend in 2003 to late 2002 when they came to the church. They were actors. And, and they came with somebody named Don Chin, who was also an actor. And they'd been on Voyager and Babylon 5 and things like that. And that was really cool. So, in Star Wars. Mainly the stories for Star Wars people. And Star Wars, have seen the sites, the holiday special, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so... There's an actor in our movie who recorded his lines before the movie even started. And, uh, and as for the stuff about Axanar, uh, that's not us at all. Uh, that we, we just did an article on Axanar. It's getting views. Mark's cards and I talked about how the CBS Paramount people decided to sue Axanar. We have not updated it since then. I'll update it in my little blog here. Um, apparently, they were making money at their studio and paying and receiving the salaries. That's how they got in trouble. So it had everything to do with them getting money and then somebody who wasn't getting paid enough complaining to Paramount. That's what it was about. Uh, nothing to do with, well, it is a copyright thing, but it's more or less a, you can't get paid for making a fan film. 
the jump, the Kickstarter that they had was laid for. It wasn't so as cynical as Mark's cards initially said. That, oh, they just want to get rid of fan films because they want Abrams' verse to work. No, it's the studio thinks they're going to make money. They will use the old universe too. They are making a new show in 2017. We can discuss that later. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if there will be a Kaimara series, although that would be awesome. Uh, but there is going to be a movie. And, uh, one movie. No, nope. we're not getting any money from Star Trek movies or parodies. Now, now fans of the Chimera out there, the Chimera role-playing thing that we had with the story, the story books, I should say, uh, the, the 2000s story books, and the Silly Trek, and Robotech thing and the trans tech thing and and the trans tech and brown press magazine, distant distance magazine. And wait for that. Um, we're bringing back all of those role playing scenarios. So there's going to be. Uh, I don't know the particulars of the Star Crackers one. It's a little shaky. Um, I'm not sure where it's going with that. One. The distant destinies one seems to have a scenario type of story in mind. I've got for that one. Uh, there's, but the, the Star Trek Chimera one will be, uh, uh, role-playing type of deal, blogger type of deal on a Facebook website coming up. Uh, this is one of the story ideas that I had submitted to the people at Trek Web when it still existed in order to keep their Trek Web alive. Uh, they refused it. And, uh, and, and although, uh, and they refused us running it, so we went and did our own blogs. <laughs> also, we've uh, gone over to Trek Core since then. It's another website, and can be found there as Chimera eight two four zero five eight two four zero five. Yeah, Calcat over there. Um, on Trek Web, I was at least one or two Chimeras, Chimera and Chimera O six, um, and. Um, and that got hacked, and they started writing all this bullshit stuff back in the day. So, uh, let's see, what other... This is mostly a recap blog, so I don't watch it. But, <laughs> let's see, anything else? The recaps from Season 7. Late Season 7, we had a long discussion on fan films, and how to write fan films. We had a long discussion on that. Uh, on Michael Gamelt's Star Trek story. Uh, which has since petered out and hasn't said anything. Since then, people have come out from, that have called Paramount Pictures and asked them, and Paramount Pictures said, we won't accept any fan submissions. So yeah, they, they said that. Uh, our website has confirmed we don't accept any fan submissions. They don't at Paramount. Uh, so yeah, we can confirm what they, what they found out. Uh, yeah, so... Not anymore. Uh, there used to be a story writing campaign that uh, in the 90s did accept fan submissions. And it was the big deal. Uh, that's how Pillar and Moore and Ken Biller's son and everything wrote for it. Um, so yeah, so that was totally that, that deal. <laughs> they were in there. And Ron Moore was totally in there. And, uh, yeah. And then there was some discussion about how, the, how uh, Andy Weir, the, the guy who did The Martian, had like an online story, The Martian, and then it became a Ridley Scott movie, and then it became this potentially Oscar-winning Best Picture coming up. And and Andy Weir, uh, he was known elsewhere. They make it look like he was totally unknown in the field, and he just made this awesome book. And a lot of it's first person. I don't really care for first person progressive. I like it to be second or third person so that does it? I, I didn't mind the book. It was great. It was good. But, but yeah, the movie is, is much better that way. Log entries are just kind of dull. I like the characters to do something in their environment. That's literally telling, not showing. I like to actually see the showing. You know, not not overly overly though. Uh, Marcel Cards and I were discussing story writing techniques and whatnot that have improved over the years, and his outline of. His long-suffering Star Crackers Maelstrom spinoff that was a spinoff idea in the second season of Star Crackers in 1994, 31 years ago, 32 years ago now. And, um, never got around to writing. It's still an outlaw. 
it's been changed and evolved over the years, and we discovered that that although I'm extremely prolific with these stories that are published and unpublished, uh, he takes forever to get there because he flourishes over the details of the scenes that he's describing. Whereas I flourish over the details of the characters I'm describing. So, <laughs> can I find a happy medium there? Star Crackers and Distant Destinies did that. And now, they're ready, almost ready for prime time, and it's going to be awesome. The Distant Destinies is coming back this year, 2016. What well, so we said it was last year. It's this year. Um, and you can see it. So, that'll be exciting. All seven books will be, will be coming out in rapid succession. Uh, followed by the Star Crackers. Uh, yeah, they'll, you'll have online versions of them. Yeah, so that'll be neat. There were seven books that were written. Uh, Maelstrom was never finished. It is still an outline. Uh, the stuff that Mark's cards thought was cool then, as, uh, as, Cal, as I pointed out at the conventions on several occasions, you have, uh, he, he would have like one concept episode. Where he'd say, like, okay, we're going to find this artificial singularity. Or we're going to find alien race, and they find the bones, and ossuary. You know. That's one premise. That's one episode. That's not a whole book. That's one premise. But he would treat it as, no, it's got to be the whole episode. They're going to spend, like, like half of the book trying to discover the ossuary. Or discover the thing, the alien sphere or thing out there. Or whatever it might be. And it's like, no, 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 you got to get to the story and the characters and the situation and the adventure. You have to go somewhere, do something interesting, and that is your background. That's where they're headed, that's where they're going, that's what they're doing. Yeah, so so it's, it's so the show don't tell and the tell don't show, they're kind of a happy medium. You kind of have to do that with stories. Um, in the case of early Star Crackers, I tended to be all dialogue not actually uh, describe what they were feeling and doing and thinking. Uh, going over season two of Star Crackers from back in the day as a novel this time. Going over the, you know, correcting it. Going there and, I, okay, I have to describe this scene a little better. I have to put the, the reader, this is not a script anymore. This is not a, a storybook for an episode anymore. It is a novel. So we need to describe a little bit of uh, the the ship, the Vanguard, arriving at the planet. Otherwise, the reader's not going to know where this setting takes place. Mark's cards would describe the setting for an entire three pages. I would describe the setting in a paragraph and say, let's go there. You know? It's, mm, shining, wondrous planet. Whatever. You know, that kind of thing. Ship races toward planet, sets into orbit. There it is. You want a, you want a little bit of brevity. You know, just to keep her reader's interest. Uh, readers nowadays, I'm not saying you should do like Michael Bay and have like jump, jump, jump everywhere. That's too confusing. No. No, it's got to have a story. You can't just jump around either. So there's this happy medium. The Martian is well written in some parts in, in that it has that, you know, description. That, that the works. That's Andy Weir captures the modern millennial writing technique. So it works. Uh, the millennials, you want to get their attention. You got to just jump in there and just you know, say that's what it is. Uh, Distant Destinies was marketed wrong in 2008 when it came out. It was marketed as Christian science fiction or young adult fiction. I would say that I would say that that's pigeonholing it a little too much. It's an expression. I would say that's narrowing it down too much. No, military science fiction that has a moral. That's better. Or even science fantasy a little bit, because it's not really... Yeah, there's like, at one point, there's a race of, like, soul-eating vampire aliens in it. <laughs> that's very fantasy. At one point, there's a planet ship, but the size of a planet. It's not really a Death Star, though. It doesn't blow things up. It space warps stuff. It could blow things up, but it doesn't act like a Death Star. And uh, it's a moon thing. I, don't think. I was not thinking of Star Wars. I was thinking it would be cool if there was a ship the size of like a small moon flying around. I, w I was thinking of that. That would be like a colony ship where there would there'd be like, guys inside it and stuff. Yeah. A bit like Greg Bear and Eon. 
It's the asteroid. Yeah. O'Neill asteroid thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's cool, too. Lots, there's lots of science fiction ideas out there. Uh, I think we've got other ones out there. And I even thought, oh, some of my short stories should be included. And then and then I read the second season of Starcrackers again and said, oh, I've already included them. Oops. <laughs> They're in there. Uh, yes. And uh, so, anyway, recaps are fun. Let's see. Uh, what else? Hmm. As I was contemplating, as I walked back from having tea, I had English English breakfast tea today, and I was going for a walk. It's a lovely, pristine, rain-swept pathways toward the church and back, and uh, and the rain-swept pathways of Milpitas. Yes, uh, the drought is over. We've had rain for two and a half months, and yeah, uh, no more drought. Um, so I was walking along the rain-swept pathways. It's winter here, and. Uh, and uh, it wasn't raining at the time. But there were puddles everywhere. And the Canadian geese had fl flown off and everything. It's not even Canada, but they were here. Uh, was, now it's more like carrions and hawks and stuff. And there was like the remains of a dead bird on the ground in the, in the woods and the soil and so forth. And uh, so I went along, on the, uh, basically right past the sets of the, uh, the Blair Witch 2 parody, Space Alien parody, X-Files spoof that we did. That was awesome. Uh, we'll probably do another one of those, but uh, since we kind of did, yeah. Um, in fact, what's kind of odd about that, uh, <laughs> you know, that alien like like spoof we did, yeah, uh, yeah. Like you know how we used to predict Star Trek a little bit back in the day. Well, we did. We had a lot of ideas that they did at the same time. Tossing an apple. The Borg, it's the robotic zombies, everybody, you know, Terminator, everyone just thought the same thing. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. You know, uh, uh, Kirk meeting Picard, way before Kirk met Picard. Figured they should just be together. Um, early on, first season, next gen. Um, and um, I was thinking like, yeah, just the wild, crazy stuff. But, uh, but, uh. Uh, Mousetrap Project 2, which was our Blair Witch Parody 2, brought the characters back together 15 years later to meet. Uh, there isn't necessarily going to be a spin-off of that, although that was an awesome pilot. And what happened is the all of these other fringe shows kind of kind of died off and tapered off a little bit. So all that's really left is what's left of Ancient Aliens. American Earth is not anymore. And uh, Ancient Aliens, which I don't really watch anymore too much, and uh, Oak Island and stuff, and there just isn't enough material to do a Clint Cowpoke uh, myste Mysteries of Milpitas type of deal. It would have to be something else and it would be completely reworked and just be like a goofy sort of maybe a one-shot episode thing. Yeah, it really didn't work to do a Hillcrest thing <laughs> before that. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's like, what I'm getting at is like Okay, some elements of the X Files premiere to season ten was a heck of a lot like that Mousetrap Project Two, including the weird sort of like goofy shit going on with a with the alien vessel and the other stuff. I think maybe Chris Carter saw that, which is cool. Um, yeah. Um, and so he just said, "Oh, we'll just retcon what we did before and have this one guy appear that was supposed to be dead and and have it be the joke at the end and have." Now, if they had Mulder, like, kiss his clone, that would have been hilarious, because that would have been literally right out of that. But. And, uh, and uh, you know, Clint Cowpoke and Silly Kelly kiss each other in, uh, in the uh, review of the Shubalafa thing. Well, yeah, that's down, incidentally. The, the Freelance Kitty 14 website has taken down the Racist for Life Charlie Brown spoof parodies. It isn't really racist. Just call it that, because it's a spoof on Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. Uh, they've taken it down due to the copyright thingies bots that came up a month ago. But uh, but it has been on for almost a month, so other torrent sites have picked it up, which is what we wanted. How they can be viewed elsewhere, somebody else has copied them, so good. Uh, they were not most offensive video, we are not related to them at all. We were spoofing them. Not related to them. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were making fun of them. So, yes. And, 
and it is ironic that we went to see uh, I went to see um, Fifty Shades of Black and liked it, whereas the Stone Gremlins guys didn't like it. But as I should point out now, after reviewing the Stone Gremlins footage again of that and another movie that The Revenant that they watched and another one that they also watched another comedy that they'd watched earlier. They don't really like movies on that channel. They don't seem to really enjoy movies. They like to be cynical, like to be cynical just to be cynical about a movie. I tend to like to enjoy movies. And even though, yeah, I mean, Fifty Shades of Black is really a dumb movie. It's awful. Uh, it isn't a horrible movie. I mean, I would totally watch it again on video, like, playing in the background. And actually, they said Haunted House 2 was bad. The little clips that I saw of it, yeah, they're, they're bad. But there are some really funny scenes in that movie, too. So, yeah, I guess I don't mind some Wayne's comedies. <laughs> some of them, sometimes. Some of them go over the top too much. But we didn't have to have, you know, some of those. Um, some of it's ridiculous. But, but yeah, um... I mean, if they were just not liking the fact that there was a fat girl stereotype in there and they were being mean to her. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, but the whole movie's mean. It's, it's supposed to be. It's Fifty Shades of Grey. Spoof. Why is this even romantic? It isn't romantic. There's nothing romantic about it. But for some reason, middle-aged ladies, yeah, they really loved it. Uh, I guess they just have a lot of time on their hands. It wasn't my thing. It was porn, but yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> Which they also addressed on the next Files premiere. They they mentioned aliens and sleeper agents and stuff like that. And I had mentioned that in my uh, review of of a movie they didn't like on Stone Gremlins called uh, The Fifth Wave. Uh, yeah, which was sort of Independence Day meets Teen X-Files, if that was a thing. Um, <laughs> it meets a little bit of Red Dawn, vaguely, a little bit of Beauty and the Beast, in that he's sort of a Stockholm Syndrome deal. Not really Beauty and the Beast. I'm a little off on that. I just had to throw Uh It's not really Red Dawn. So it wasn't... Yeah, Fifth Wave, I agree with the Stone Gremlins people that it was pretty much in agreement with them that, that it was not a very good movie. It, yeah, it has a lot of flaws. Uh, but it's like, yeah, it's just like, I guess the book was okay from what I've read of it, but it, it's not something that needed to be a movie. I mean, my, my novel should be a movie. <laughs> but yeah, um... <laughs> But I'm going to direct and produce it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be like the, uh, you know, the Wallflower guy, you know. Well, not like the Wallflower guy, but but in that he got to post it. Or, or like Danny Weir. And I'm going to be like, you know, I'm going to be all, well, well, you know, I've got to be a producer on this. You know? Or at least uh, the guy that helps the producer. I wouldn't be the, the executive producer because then I wouldn't be able to fit the money. But I should, I should be... A definitely consultant on my stuff, if not the guy almost in charge of my stuff, so that you know. <laughs> so the yeah yeah they were talking about aliens and stuff, but aliens among us and all that, and and then there was another website talking about is evolution stopped and stuff and all that evolution and mutation and all that. And we can go on about that later, but uh. I don't think evolution has stopped because we're we're kind of forcing evolution a little bit. We have we have one in thirty some kids have autism of some kind. Uh, one in forty five kids have ADD of some kind. We are creating generations of unusual uh, communication things as a result of the environment that we are changing. So we are changing our environment. Uh, ecologically, we are changing our environment, polluting it mainly, the global climate change and all that. We are destroying the Earth, slow but sure, but uh, 
either either <laughs> directly or indirectly. Um, and yeah, I don't think the human race is headed toward a bottleneck. I don't think it's headed toward like like blind and blue eyed people suddenly disappearing. I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think we're all gonna just like mesh together into one group either. There's too much diversity. We're seven billion people on the planet. I think we need to go out into space. We need to uh, have other colonies and habitats in space. We've always needed to uh, since the, the atomic age. We need to get out there. And I think once we do, we'll discover that there are aliens and it's probably closer to Star Trek and closer to AI and some of those other <laughs> movies and things uh, than we want to admit. The human race is not unique, and that we are probably like the Twilight Zone episode that dealt with experiments and stuff like that. We're not necessarily the product of ancient aliens, that's a little silly, but I wouldn't be surprised if ancient aliens came, or some sophisticated alien race in my lifetime, that they came to Earth. And they said pretty much all the stuff you kind of made up afterward. Yeah, about the probes, about that. That really didn't happen. All this other stuff about, like, like history and the nature of humanity and all that. You're kind of off on that. Here's the deal. Yeah, you were sort of a backwater planet. I kind of address that in my science fiction books, too. Earth is sort of a... Ooh, I like the idea that Earth is like the working stiff planet. It was basically left behind, sort of. <laughs> and the idea that, like, the, like no, there's nothing special about the Earth. It's just sort of the suburbs of a larger galactic empire. And basically, the, the humans are... <laughs> human race is just like, oh, we forgot about you. You were a, sort of a failed experiment. Yeah, we just, you know, sorry. <laughs> I just think that would be hilarious. Be like the like the religions and pol politi politicians of the world would be like, oh, shit, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. People of Earth, yeah, you, we forgot about you centuries ago, eons even. Yeah, just waiting for you to advance far enough to figure that out. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> now, there is your ironic twist of your uh, future sci-fi teen comedy thing. The slacker planet. Now, don't steal that, Internet, because that's also coming. Uh, that, is, that is one of the premises of a uh, sci-fi story that Mark's Cards and I had been working on since Bacon last year. When, when it was suggested by the Winter Twins, science fiction writers, uh, fantasy, more like fantasy writers, they dispense fantasy thriller, I guess, writer. When they suggested, take one of your earlier stories and just change the premise so that it's, it's, uh, uh put it in space. Take, <laughs> you know, just change it around, you know, something like that. And we had this story. Called the fictional Avengers TFA, huh, same initials as Star Wars. Uh, yeah, and, and it had been around, and other people had borrowed it, made their own little versions out there. They even, somebody even did an anti-video of the old school that I used to train at, which was weird. Of one of the TFA videos, it's weird. I didn't do that, but <laughs> I guess they liked it. And they put up the name that Jane Foster, of course, we, Jane Piedmont. Of course, we have to change that because they put it up there. But yeah, so. Mm. So, yeah, we changed it. It's not in the story anymore. Somebody else. But the premise all along was, okay, let's, let's, let's do a, like a, let's take this stoner comedy series with, with them having really not much responsibilities and this sort of off-color thing we couldn't place anywhere. I'm not going to name the name yet until it comes out. Uh, let's take this and go with it. And make it a space opera. So they're in space. It's hundreds of years after Earth has been left behind and polluted and become the lesser planet. They're off into another planet. Uh, it seems a little like that. That 
weird 1960s era show that came out last year. Except that wasn't, as it turned out, the Canadian show where they were supposedly on a ship headed to Alpha Centauri. And there was a Canadian show and it was out and it was about like a colony headed toward a planet, uh, a planet Proxima Centauri planet. But uh turned out that that show, uh, which I saw the synopsis for, uh, was not like our show because that show jumped the shark. That show had a really stupid ass ending of the season and they canceled it after that. Uh, it's like, like, like yeah, the, the, there's this Canadian show, and they jumped the shark, and they basically said, okay, they're not really in space. It was all a trick, like the end of Cube or something. And it was like, ooh, it's a trick. It was really a trick. They were in a, a lab. Okay, That's dumb. That's not how you do a story about them in a lab. How you do a story about them in a lab is you have it be an O'Neill colony. And they realize they're on a ship. You do the Heinlein version. You have them on a ship. You realize they're on a ship. Um... However, they're stoner slackers in this story idea. So, they're on an O'Neill type of ship. You know, in a sense, it's an O'Neill ship. And they're heading out into space. And then more on that later. <laughs> but, uh, in my version, it is actually, they are in space. It's, it's, it's the 1980s, but it's not the 1980s as we know it. It's their 1980s. And they're headed to this planet. And it's really a planet. They're really headed in space. It's not a cop-out. Yeah, and the baby that was introduced in the original show is not there because Mars Cars doesn't like that. Introducing a baby kills it. So, yeah, they're, they're headed there, and, yeah. And there's a little bit of some of my nieces and nephews came up with ideas over the years that's in that story because it was from the 90s. It was, it was right up there with Star Crackers, Distant Destinies. that were all written around the same time. So, yeah. So, all these 90s stories are coming back, including... The rewritten fictional adventures. I can't give away the title, but it is in space on an O'Neill type of colony ship. It's different than an O'Neill colony ship, though, in the sense of how it's built. It's different. Yeah, instead of the Taurus being one way, it's inverted. So it's on the outside. And then on the outside. But yeah, it's going to be cool. So I haven't. I, I figured out how it looks. I described it quite well. And, uh, yes, we were working on a science fiction story. We weren't looking. And it actually, in in a vague sense, was the Maelstrom. It's not called Maelstrom, but it was one of the Maelstrom stories. So now it is the fictional adventure story. It's going to be cool. I have not yet named it. But it's not the one Mark's Cards originally thought of. It's the one that Calcat sort of did a spinny sort of thing of it's going to be under my real name, of course. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, another collaboration from us. Uh, it's newer because it's newer, so, yeah. So, we'll see what that looks like. Yeah. So, that, that's gonna be neat. Uh, that's a new one. And it is one of the Maelstrom stories. But it's been completely r r uh, taken that premise of the O'Neill ship. That was one of the story ideas. And, and said, okay, let's put the space slackers on this ship. Let's make it literally the working stiffs and the space slackers on a ship. Kind of like Star Crackers, but it's not a patrol group. This is a, uh, like a, a city in space. Going through space. Yeah, colony. It's that colony story we've been working on for decades. In the 90s, we thought of this colony story. I not know what to do with it. I don't know. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, anyway. So, um, Yeah. And uh, hopefully the internets will not steal... Well, even if they stole the premise of an O'Neill colony, that's a science fiction trope. So they wouldn't really be stealing this idea. It would be having their own. But totally, I would I would be all for Art Linkletter, you know, Mr. Linkletter, directing this movie. In collaboration with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, Ridley Scott. You know how weird that would be far out. Ridley Scott and, and Linkletter should totally get on board with this one. <laughs> it's like Boyhood meets 2001. Yeah. Space. Meets Rendezvous with Rama. Also, Arthur C. Clarke. One of my favorite authors who is now deceased. Arthur C. Clarke. Who was really cool. Yeah, she'd be like, well, Gerald was in strong humor. 
It's the monolith. Ah. It of course, Mark's car. Before I add, before I go, Mark's car's idea of the monolith is a pink tile tower rising in the sky on the on the planet Desiree and Starcrackers. And the crew looks at this pink tower, staring in awe. It's so beautiful that they start weeping. This giant pink tower, and the sexist character, Henderson, on the planet with them. Looks up at it. There's up at it. Yep, that's the biggest penis I've ever seen. <laughs> There's your moment of zen, as they used to say. That's not in my story, but I'm just saying that's, that's a Star Cracker scene from the other one. Yeah, it's not a porno. It's just that this is one scene in which Henderson thinks the tower's a dick. But yeah, um, so there, there's Star Crackers is a funny one, yeah, and this other one is a funny one too. So yeah, it's not dark and serious and in in global warming. Thing. It's not dark and serious. If Pixar wants to animate this, you know, not the pink tower thing, but if they want to, no, the t uh, fictional thing, space thing. Anyway, so they're not going to animate a pink tower weenie. No, they're not going to do that. I, that would not be Pixar. That might be DreamWorks, but that wouldn't be Pixar. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's it. That's all of my rant for tonight. Ah, on February 1st, 2016. Mmm. <laughs>